GM, G Eigen, B Grange. Another episode of the Eigen Layer ABS series today with our good friend Ishmael from Lagrange. Welcome to Eigen Layer Unlocked, an interactive educational journey through the Eigen Layer ecosystem created by technical founders and builders for the entire crypto community. A special thank you to our partners, All Layer, Polymer, Authentic, Skate, and Lagrange for helping to make this happen. Our goal is to raise the collective knowledge of the Eigenlayer AVS ecosystem and unpack the technical designs of the top teams in space. Welcome to Eigenlayer Unlocked. GM, G Eigen, B Grange. Another episode of the Eigenlayer AVS series today with our good friend Ishmael from Lagrange. And uh, Ishmael, you're no stranger to the show, so welcome back. I'm not. I, I think I've been on the roll up more than any other podcast, and I will keep coming back. This is this is by far my uh, my favorite place to discuss Lagrange and a lot of the interesting things we've been working on. You guys were early to Eigen, early to Lagrange, and I think you directionally everything you guys talk about comes true. I hope so, and uh, and yeah, I mean this. Uh, you know, if if the roll up had a. Uh, a roll up hall of fame. I think you would be a first ballot. So <laughs> awesome. More, that. more ZK uh, coverage coming away. Uh, Ishmael and Lagrange, you guys are obviously building a ZK coprocessor. One of the first AVSs on Eigen layer and uh, some of the most stake allocated to your coprocessor. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and obviously we're still very early to ZK and uh, coprocessors in general. So yeah, Absolutely uh, love the topic. Uh, I'm glad that you're here uh, to educate us and our community about it. And uh, let's let's dive in. Yeah. So we put together some slides. I know usually we keep it a little bit more free form, but there's a lot of really exciting developments that have been core to Lagrange over the last two years since the foundation of the company. And a lot of it has kind of come together into a synthesis very recently of a direction that I think is unique in the space. And it's a direction that combines the work that we've done on ZK with the work that we have done alongside Eigenlayer. And it's this concept that very broadly I like to call the internet of proving. This basic idea that the future of zero knowledge is a large amount of independent applications that use ZK as part of different parts of their core function. So to make it very specific, state proofs for interop protocols, um, uh, ZK uh, proofs for rollups, validity proofs for rollups, and then execution proofs for coprocessors. All of that coming from one central point. Um, and so, yeah, and so we'd like to talk about kind of this evolution of blockchain architectures as starting with the first generation of chains, the first, the first chain being Bitcoin, a, a consensus based on proof of work, to the second generation, that is this evolution to proof of stake systems where economic guarantees coming from the con, uh, consensus validators were used and are used to produce blocks, where the attestation to the chronology of a chain at some point in time and a fork choice rule over how uh, a leader is able to propose a, a change to that chronology from the execution of transactions is core to producing the next um, uh, independently verifiable unit of that chain's history. And now we talk about this evolution towards a third generation architecture. And this is a proof-based future. This is a point where every block is not guaranteed safety by an economic guarantee of attestation. It's guaranteed safety by a proof where the, the block itself is composed of requests and verifications of proofs from other execution spaces or from other off-chain compute sources. And the actual validity of that block of the state transition function is also guaranteed by a proof. It is in essence the use of ZK at all levels of the stack. This is what we think of as this third generation of blockchain architectures. And this is where Lagrange sits at the core and what we talk about as this internet of proving. Coprocessors, ZK rollups, ZK interop, all of those together create this veritable internet, this veritable network of networks of verifiable zero knowledge compute. 
I can keep going, but I don't know if you want to you want to ask anything. <laughs> jump in. I, yeah, I mean, I I think I think you're setting the stage here, so I'm going to try not to interrupt too much. But if I have any burning questions, I, I will jump in. Perfect. Um, and so, yeah, the we like to call this concept the Internet of Proving. It is basically, as I was saying before, this idea that every application in crypto will use proofs for something. Some will use it for guaranteeing the validity of your execution space for a rollup. Some will use it for requesting heavy off-chain compute from a coprocessor. And some will use that for interop, for being able to access cross-chain state. And together, it forms this network of networks where you have networks specializing in the computation of specific proofs and delivering those proofs to a variety of different um, downstream partners. And so we were very fortunate to have been one of the first companies to launch um, on Eigenlayer and the first company to launch a, a ZK Prover on Eigenlayer. Our state committee product is delivering proofs now to Layer Zero, Axler, and Polymer. Um, our coprocessor product is delivering proofs to teams like Azuki, EtherFi, Gearbox, um, and a number of other ones we've yet to announce that we're very excited for. Um, and very broadly, we're launching a new train of proving very soon related to some rollups that I can't share more about today, but expect some big things very soon. But at the core, every proof comes back from the same network of networks run at the core by top institutional operators, people like Coinbase, OKX, Kraken, who are generating proofs across every single domain of the space all from one unified substrate. And so the question that people always ask us is why, why Eigenlayer? Why would you use Eigenlayer as this place for economic security and staking to generate zero-knowledge proofs? Um, you know, don't you not need economic security for generating zero-knowledge proofs? It's a very common question I'm asked. But let's take a step back for a minute. At the core, what a proof is able to do is guarantee the safety of a computation. So you can say, I don't have to trust Ismail to give me the correct computation over some data for the coprocessor. I don't have to trust Ismail to give some computation over data for this cross-chain state or for validity proof for rollup. All I have to do is verify the proof. But what you still have to trust, even with the proof, is that I'll actually give you the proof. The liveness of the delivery of that proof is not guaranteed. So if your application needs a validity proof or a coprocessor proof or a state proof at a certain point of time to underwrite some state transition or some specific action, you still need to guarantee that the, you will get it when you request it. And that's this concept of liveness within blockchains, within prover networks, within zero knowledge systems more broadly. The way we guarantee that is through stick. And the way we get that stake with the lowest cost of capital and the most favorable cost structure in crypto is through restaking. Um, very complex prover needs can be met very succinctly and very simply by using the core Lagrange prover network, prover market, which is in effect just a network of more networks. It's the internet of proving. And so to make this very concrete, you know, how does this work? Well, at a very high level, when you want a proof, you request it from what we call a gateway. A gateway is able to manage the relationship between a proof requester and a, a pool of provers who will compute those proofs based on demand. That gateway announces a new prover task or a group of prover tasks to all provers who have subscribed to generating a certain uh, topic of proofs. And those provers bid on uh, the ability to generate those proofs. This is through a novel paper called Double Auctions for Dynamic Research, Resource Allocation that our team has come up with. Um, that is, to our knowledge and to our belief, the first and the only incentive compatible structure for, um, for pricing of proofs in a heterogeneous resource market within a prover network. Um, if the operator generates the proof on time, within a given time slot, they receive their proof payment, they receive a fee. Um, for generating that proof. And if they fail to generate the proof, they receive a penalty. You can think of this very much like a block validation, right? You're a Ethereum validator. You have a slot under which you can execute an attestation or propose a block. Um, and if you don't meet your requirements, you face an economic penalty. Except what we're talking about here is not 
a signature or validation action, we're talking about the generation of proof. This is why I call this the evolution of blockchain architectures. Moving from an entirely crypto economic system to a proof-based future where crypto economic guarantees on eigenlayer are used for liveness. And so I mentioned this idea of our double auction design, but what we haven't talked about is why this matters. Why does it matter to have an incentive compatible auction design to match buyers and sellers? And why would a user care, right? Why would anyone care about any of this stuff beyond an interesting paper? And the reason is because incentives and efficient pricing are core to making sure you have to pay the least amount possible to be able to get what you want. If the network has collusion or it doesn't have group strategy proofness, which is the academic term for that, then it means that the amount you pay could be proportionally much higher. There could be rent seeking done by provers. If the network isn't able to guarantee efficient pricing or welfare maximization, another of the properties that we discuss in detail and depth in the paper, then there's no guarantee that you get to pay the lowest possible fee or that across the whole network, proofs will be delivered in a way that maximizes everyone's ability to get what they need from this network. And so by solving for these core properties, buyers have the best experience possible, as do sellers, which means that everyone we've discussed from the NFT projects like Azuki to the DeFi projects like Gearbox, EtherFi, and more, Tokamak, Usual Money, all the way to some of the roll-up partners, all the way to the interop protocols like Polymer, Layer Zero, Axler, all can have the best experience possible as buyers of proofs. And many of the provers, the institutional operators who are generating these proofs, can make sure that what they receive for generating them is proportionately higher than anywhere else in the industry. When everyone wins, we believe that networks succeed. And so what I want to end with is just a way for people to get involved. So we're doing a hackathon right now alongside Eigenlayer and Altlayer, where we have a bounty for using our ZK coprocessor, which I've discussed briefly before. We also are throwing the inaugural Proof Summit, Lagrange's uh, owned event at um, DevCon, alongside many of our partners, including Polymer and Altlayer. Um, and we also invite everyone to join our Discord and to follow us on Twitter or X to stay apprised of some updates that are coming very soon. And if you want to run a prover, alongside some of the top operators in the space, reach out to our team. We're always looking for new people who can participate as network participants, who can run provers, who can run um, infrastructure, and who want to generate rewards and fees from doing so. So that's the presentation. Um, and it would be great to move into kind of some some dialogue over over any type Let's of do it. to dive into. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, frankly, what, one of the things that I, I love about the presentation was one of the last things you said, which is that networks succeed when everyone wins. Yeah. Um, I, I really like that, and I think that is something that Sariram and Eigenlayer have alluded to uh, over the course of their 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 development, which is that these infinite games. And these positive sum games are, you know, there's kind of like levels to it. You have zero sum, then you have positive sum, and then you have infinite sum. And mm -hmm. so Eigenlayer becomes sort of this network of infinite sum games, Lagrange being one of those. And so diving, you know, a little bit deeper into Lagrange and it, it's its network here, you know, yeah. I, I think maybe it's a little bit, it, it's pretty straightforward, but um, who are the, like, the supply and demand side of Lagrange's network. Um, and then, you know, you mentioned that like a lot, a big part of this mm -hmm. is incentive compatibility between the two. Yeah. And so, you know, I think at a surface level, it's not, it's not as simple as just like an order book, right. Of people yeah. like bidding on proofs. So could you just expand a little bit upon like the economics that you guys have come up with and maybe the secret sauce is in these double auctions, but could you just unpack that a little bit more and and help you know me and our audience understand the incentive compatibility between the supply and demand side of Lagrange's network. Yeah. So very broadly speaking, we define a set of properties under which 
we believe a network to be incentive compatible. This is very similar to what Ethereum did with defining the properties in, in Tim uh, Roughgarden's paper related to Ethereum's transaction fee mechanism. And the properties that we define are truthfulness, group strategy proofness, welfare maximization, uh, budget balanced, and computationally efficient. Um, in effect, it is, can we run an auction efficiently that is both compute efficient, ensures that everyone involved is able to maximize their own outcome, and to ensure that the reported prices and the dominant strategy is to have the correct private values reported um, to the auctioneer by both the buyers and sellers of compute. And in this case, um, we work on a double auction mechanism that has a novel composition rule of how we match buyers and sellers such that participants of the network can have guarantees that those properties are met. And when we talk about our ecosystem, it is really about how do we ensure that, you know, the, the group in this diagram under ZK Prover Network, the, the people who are lending and who are, apply, or who are providing compute can guarantee that what they're receiving is the best possible outcome. And how can we ensure that all of the people using our zero knowledge proofs, the people using our coprocessor, you know, Azuki, Etherfy, Gearbox, and more soon, the people using our state proofs, all are able to guarantee that what they receive is um, the lowest cost for the proofs possible. Uh, and that's the core of where our network um, prioritizes this incentive compatibility. Um, yep. And then, you know, very broadly speaking, we know the, the the kind of the concept that we kind of talk about with this is is kind of the ELI five idea of the Internet of Proving. The idea being that you have this this universal substrate under which you want to derive proofs from. You want to be able to request some type of proof or some type of um, uh, verifiable information from somewhere within a network, whether that be information on computation, information on state, information over the state transition, information over some execution. And you want what's returned back not to be that information, but to be that information in addition to a proof. Awesome. Okay. Um, and so drilling a little bit deeper into the, the economics here, like you have you have the ZK Prover network, and these are these are the entities that are supplying the proofs, and mm -hmm. and there are computational resources that are required to to generate a proof. Yeah, and and Coinbase, OKX, Kraken, and these you know tier one partners are are mm -hmm. they they have a cost to generate this proof, and so let's say, mm -hmm. um, let's call that like the cost of the task, right? Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, call it the demand side. You have coprocessors and those who are uh, consuming these state state proofs, um, yep. the layer zeros and the and the usual monies and the ether fives of the world, mm -hmm. and those are buying. Those guys are buying the proofs. Um, now, the 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 entities that are buying the proof are are you know paying for the cost uh, to the zk prover network, and then and then some right, and then there's a delta, and Lagrange may be capturing that delta, but then a port, at least a portion of that, is going to stakers in the form of APY. And so maybe you could talk a bit about Lagrange's fee mechanism, yeah. how how stakers in Lagrange's uh, AVS ultimately end up um, earning this this APY. Uh, through yeah, this, through, yeah, that's a phenomenal question. You know, I, I think very broadly every AVS blockchain network has two costs. The first being a capital cost, you know, the, the expectation of yield on capital that's provided and the opportunity cost that exists on that capital through other sources. And then it has an operational cost. How much does it cost to run this infrastructure? Um, and with POS chains, usually the capital cost is the most expensive component. The amount you have to pay for a tendermint chain, for instance, the validator sets is typically 25, 15, 35 percent. It, it, it can vary substantially, but it's usually in the double digits. And you can look at you know staking rewards to see what most POS chains are paying. Now, if you look at the operational cost of those chains, it's it's pretty low. The amount it costs to run a validator is proportionally much lower than the amount that the chain has to pay 
to offset the opportunity cost and the capital. ZK is almost a diametrically opposite design. A prover network has very high uh, operational cost. The amount of, of hardware that's required, the, the complexity of running that hardware are much higher. That said, because stake is only being used to guarantee liveness, the amount that's being paid to stakers can be much lower because the stake is not at risk to the same extent it is in a POS chain. And so the way the network works is that, to your point earlier, a user requests a proof from the co-processor, from the state committees, or from one of the other things we're announcing soon. And from there, you're able to, <laughs> from there, like that face, from there, you're able to um, uh, pay a fee to the network to receive that proof. And that's generally through a contract that emits an event or through just a direct request from one of the gateways. When that proof is generated and delivered back, um, uh, the prover is remunerated for that. And the amount the prover receives is proportionate to what they bid. So the profit margin on a prover depends on what they run, what hardware they run. And this is why over time, these market-based designs converge back to having substantially lower um, uh, cost than oftentimes just a, a, a SaaS or a cloud-based uh, proving service. Because the incentive is on every operator to optimize their costs. Where if you can underbid everyone else by one cent and still maintain a profit margin of 50%, that's a very great economic incentive for you to be in, an economic position for you to be in. There's a, a, an incentive to optimize provers by someone besides the core team in order to be able to increase the profit margin on generating these. And you know, if we talk about the size of the proving market right now, it's about 150 million from our, our predict, from our assessment annually, if we look at rollups, co-processors, state proofs, in terms of the amount being spent generally on cloud now and compute costs. And there's a, a very large pie available for anyone who can take existing implementations of, of a lot of these provers, optimize them, and increase their profit margin. And a market and an auction that assigns work based on bids is the best way to allow people to capture that value and to create positive externalities over cheaper cost and better performance, re in resulting in um, material, uh, material revenue, material profit for operators. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense. And, and just kind of like, uh, I guess, briefly kind of characterize this like you know th this is a stark transition from that of like a proof of stake or tenement chain which mm -hmm. has relatively low operational costs just to run a few validators but a very high capital cost and yes. in the in the range of 10 to 15 percent paying for that for that economic security whereas uh, uh an avs and particularly a zk avs um mm -hmm. has a very low capital cost uh, you know uh due to restaking but a very high operational cost per task um, mm -hmm. uh, for each of these proofs that are getting generated. Now, um, you know, one of the actually quick, quick, quick tangent, which is that a while yeah. ago we were doing one of these, we were doing one of these episodes and it was, you know, everything moves so fast in this industry. And so at the time, I think, you know, you guys were working on your prover and there was another entity that had undergone some sort of transition. They were doing a prover. Uh, but then they ended up going more into the prover network uh, mm -hmm. realm. And at the time, you had told me, like, you know, you guys are focused on the the real ZK, right? Which is those who are are building uh, building the provers, the ones that, yeah. the, right? And maybe going into prover network was almost like an easy way out. It, do you, is there like a new, is there new evidence that kind of supports prover networks and like lowering the operational cost dramatically? Or is, are the prover networks mostly just like a, I mean, generally, how do you reconcile like this, yeah. you know, the doing a prover network versus being one of those entities that is helping to uh, generate those proofs via yeah. either a, a ZK VM or a circuit? Yeah, this is, this is, this is a great, this is a great um, comment. So very broadly, Lagrange builds a coprocessor. We build a, a prover that we use to verify arbitrary SQL computation um, over blockchain data. 
that's kind of the core function of our coprocessor. Um, you can write any type of SQL statement that you'd want to run. We can parse that SQL statement into what's called an abstract syntax tree, and we can prove that computation of our data. And so that is one of the core things that's deployed on top of our network. The second core thing that's deployed is our state committees. And state committees are state proofs for, for rollups, or state proofs generated from optimistic rollups to like a fast pre-confirmation design in essence that we distribute through a lot of our cross-chain partners. Um, and so both of those are kind of core products that we, we build. And so the imperative on those two core products is to have a network that underpins them that can guarantee liveness on delivering those, right? So, you know, Azuki uses, uses our prover, Etherfy uses our prover, Gearbox uses our prover, um, and a number of other DeFi protocols will now soon use our prover, um, just as, you know, Axel or Polymer or Layer 0 use, use state proofs for DVN in, in Layer 0. We have an integration with, with Polymer and Axel. We're, we're part of their, we're going to be soon part of their cross-chain um, uh, amplifier protocol. And so the question of, you know, why would you, use a prover network comes down to do you feel that there is a reason to build one yourself versus do you think there is a reason to deploy another one and so we have a very bespoke architecture that we that we um have been working with some of our very close partners on that we think has very accretive economics overall for their design and so as we've increased building our own product along the lines of our ZK coprocessor and our state committees, there are certain things that our team has built that are actually very extensible for other teams. So, you know, building a, a production grade decentralized auction for resource allocation in a dynamically and horizontally scalable network is complex. And we've found that, you know, while it is not complex to just spin up a couple AWS instances and call yourself a prover network, it is very complex if you want incentive compatibility, resource pricing, and a very robust and dynamic set of institutional operators. Maintaining that operator base, ensuring that they have the right upgrade paths, ensuring they have the right binaries they're running, ensuring they're participating properly. All of that stuff is a, is a very large overhead. And so there's some teams that we've that we've spent time with um, who have started to feel that, that being able to move some of that onto a network that's already generating proofs in production for a variety of other applications is, is beneficial for them. But broadly speaking, I'm actually kind of bearish on these general concepts of prover networks because I, I, I don't think you, you, really need, um, you really need a company that just builds network a network um, if that network is not fundamentally differentiated in, in what they can offer to you. Um, and if the, the economics of that network aren't, aren't beneficial to you. So to, to make that very concrete, you know, let's say, you know, there's, there's, there's the Robbie Prover network and it has Robbie token. Um, and I, let's say I have a proving demand of about $10 million a year for, for let's say a couple of my products. Um, would I route all $10 million of my fees per year to Robbie's network and Robbie's token? Likely not. It just doesn't make sense. But if someone came to me, and they said, hey, you know, Ismail, um, we'll build the whole prover network for you. We'll build the auction for you. And we want nothing. Would I do it? Yeah, obviously, I'd save, I'd save a lot of money. So there's something in the middle between the network takes nothing and the current design of these networks, which is these giant monolithic, basically POS chains with some provers plugged into them that try to take everything, right? The, the left side has taken, has gotten no PMF. And the right side means there's a very high overhead for everyone to build things, right? It means that when Lagrange said in, you know, in May or May, April, hey, you know, we want to be able to have a network to deliver our proofs for our customers so they can trust that they get there on time, so they can trust there's liveness. There's no option but to build it ourselves. Either we lose all of our revenue or build it ourselves. I, I think that architectures like what we have, and we'll have a lot more public on docs very soon, they, they find the middle ground. They let teams maintain sovereignty and agency over what they're doing, the same way that we maintain sovereignty and agency over our proofs within our network. But they do so in a way that, that makes it a actually very reasonable decision to underwrite moving your proving onto an external network. And this is why we kind of talk about this internet of proving or this network of networks, because it really isn't you deploying on Lagrange's network. It's you deploying a network that mimics an architecture that Lagrange has, much like a rollup. Right, you deploy an optimism rollup, but it's still base. Right, you deploy a, a optimistic rollup, but you know it, it might be on the arbitrum stack. You can deploy uh, uh, what we call a supernet 
that that benefits from all of the things that we've talked about as a production grade infrastructure to run your prover on that exists within the broader context of our internet of proving our network of networks okay i do want to hear more about supernets so stay tuned but um i I, I want to make a quick analogy and I, I think mm -hmm. I am at risk of oversimplifying it, but yeah. you know, one of the, one of the things about uh, just to draw a parallel here to the interop space, you know, uh, uh, on the other side of the ZK interop is, is kind of like the intense based interop. And, and so yeah. across is one of those projects that has done quite well. Uh, and like, you know, pretty uh, uh accepted into the into the bridge landscape and one criticism of their technology has been that you know they run their own solver right and so basically you know they they have their their uh their solver and they say that it's a solver network but really like mm -hmm. most of it just goes through their one solver right and it's not like you don't yeah. have a very like robust decentralized network of solvers and mm -hmm. so when we're looking at the zk prover network is and you know, is it, is it akin to like Lagrange has deployed its prover? Is that, and then it's one of the provers amongst the ZK prover network. Is that akin to like across has deployed their solver and it's one of the solvers amongst that solver network. But, you know, granted these two, yeah. these two networks have different levels of decentralization to it. I think the best way to think of it is like as an app chain or a rollup. Um, that's the analogy I think makes the most sense. If you want to, if you're if you're a high usage application and you said I need dedicated execution space, you're not going to go build your own side chain or build your own rollup stack. It just isn't reasonable, right? If you want a zk rollup, you would contact a RAS provider or you would contact zk sync or uh, Polygon or Linea or Scroll or or even Starkware. And you would say, I have this thing that I want to deploy on, on a chain in your network, and I want to be able to deploy my own execution space with my own token, with my own economics, with my own design, but I want it to be on your stack and part of your broader elastic chain or ag layer or super or super super chain or or you know the the uh, orbit L3s. You you effectively want economic sovereignty while simultaneously wanting the ability to build on an existing stack. This is the same thing with Cosmos, right? If you want a Cosmos chain, you're not going to roll your own. If you want, to, if you want a chain, you're not going to roll your own your own consensus stack, right? It's a lot of teams will build on Cosmos stack, and they'll use IBC and they'll use all the out of the box engineering frameworks that are available to them. They, they they want their own token, they want their own design, they want they have value capture, but they'll participate in a broader network as part of that, and that's very much the idea here. Coprocessors is something that our coprocessors, you know, it's a state of the art proving system that our team builds. We have multiple papers that underlie it. We have actually two new papers coming out soon on uh, like a new form of snark that, that's updatable, as well as um, on a new verifiable SQL construction for joins. Our state committee product's been in production for like eight months at this point. It's delivered, you know, oh, probably over a million proofs at this point. Um, and so th these are production grade products and Lagrange needs to maintain economic sovereignty over the proving revenue on these for us to operate and exist as a business. Just as if you build a ZKVM, you know, you need to maintain sovereignty over your ZKVM proving revenue. If you build a rollup stack, you have to maintain sovereignty over that revenue as well. Um, and what we offer is, is very similar to that. You know, you, you build a rollup and you want sovereignty over your, 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 your uh, sequencer fees, you want sovereignty over your gas token. You deploy a prover network, you deploy a proving stack, you deploy on Lagrange, you want sovereignty over something else in your network. You want it over the, the, fee, the fee token that provers are being paid in. You want it over staking requirements. You want it over specifics of the auction design. You want it over seats of who gets to do proving. You want all of these things that mean that it's your network, but it will exist in the broader context of our internet of proving. Yep, and I think that makes sense uh the the app chain analogy makes sense here mm -hmm. as well as the, the roll up more broadly but the app chain narrative you know kind of talked about all of these it is very closely associated with sovereignty um mm -hmm. because now you know there's more dedicated block space um but granted there is 
interop that connects all of these app chains and we, yes. we want deeper interop and ultimately we want composability between these app chains and so a fully connected uh internet of app chains would look a lot like uh a fully connected web of um uh you know, like Z zk uh enabled app chains in that internet as well and lagrange is helping to connect those together um okay so that was one tangent uh, thank you. For I love that one. I love that one. <laughs> and to, to add on. one very quick point, you know, yeah. we, we talk about sovereignty and we talk about the evolution of what sovereignty means, right? Two, three years ago, sovereignty meant you want to deploy your own app chain on the Cosmos or on, uh, you know, a parachain on Polkadot. You want agency over your gas token. You want agency over your execution client. You want agency over customizations, over, over how you build block space, block time, all this stuff. Right, but you wanted to deploy in a stack that was production grade. Now we're talking about a proof-based future. Every app will use proofs, I believe, and I think we are very quickly moving in the direction where we will see this in the next eighteen months. And the question then becomes: If everyone uses proofs, do we need sovereignty over them? Do we need sovereignty over who generates them? Do we need sovereignty over how they're paid for? Do we need sovereignty over over what stake to guarantee liveness? I would contend that we do. And I would contend that the architecture that's going to be the most accretive and infinite sum across all of this is going to be the one that allows customization, configuration, and ownership and sovereignty. Yep. Um, I want to double click on one thing you said there, which is I think the main uh, the main reason that you know you guys and Eigenlayer are working closely together, and yep. that is using economic security for liveness where yes. predominantly you guys are cryptographically secured put, you know with with zk proofs and that's mm -hmm. kind of like the main the main output of the business yeah. the the liveness isn't guaranteed uh but cryptographically it's it's incentive based uh and crypto economically secured and so so we actually had a had a podcast and part mm -hmm. of the series as well with Tarun who helped yeah unpack the math behind uh economic security on a per task basis and and help answer the question of how we can value economic security and and you know you pointed to like the low cost of capital um and and so how actually do we value that capital and one of the things that that fell out of that conversation was um an adaptation that eigenlayer made in their security model where it used to be totally pooled everything you know was yeah. was pulled together and then you could kind of have um let's say i had 100 eth that i was staking and i could use that 100 eth to stake in avsa and avsb could both use that economic security my, my 100 eth but in reality you know there were some issues because if avsa slashes me you know that could have an impact on avsb mm -hmm. now that that led to this to what tarun was calling a unique stake, almost like a reserve ratio for AVSs. Mm -hmm. Some some AVSs may need a high reserve ratio of stake yeah. um, be, to protect against like a black swan event. Yes, now, I'm starting to maybe answer my own question here, but I so I I think I'm going to phrase this as an assumption, but please correct me yeah. if I'm wrong. Um, I would assume that you guys wouldn't need a very high unique stake. You guys could set your reserve ratio that stakers, you know, have to uniquely stake into uh, the Lagrange AVS relatively low because you're only staking for liveness and not uh, having, you wouldn't have any significant um, flashing event uh, that that would, you know, re reduce a, a, a staker stake by a dramatic amount. And the, the example that Tarun gave was like an Oracle would maybe only be able to move the price, you know, 50 basis points or, or one to 2%. And so that wouldn't lead to some dramatic staking uh, slashing mm -hmm. event. Um, and so they wouldn't need a very high unique stake amount. How, how does this land in the Lagrange case? Yeah. Do you guys need a very high unique stake ratio or can you guys be a little bit more capital efficient and, and a lower stake ratio in, in the ABS? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think what it comes down to in all of these conversations is the very simple equation of cost of corruption versus profit for corruption from corruption. Mm 
So what does it cost me to compromise some system and what do I profit in doing so? And so the good thing about ZK systems is the amount that a adversarial actor can benefit from um, corrupting liveness is generally not very high. If you are expected to generate a proof and the proof takes 30 seconds to generate and you miss your slot, you face a penalty of some type and you get moved off of and someone else generates that. And if the, if the network dynamically allocates work uh, by a composition of both bidding and then operator performance, you're able to design something that is very strongly, um, that's, that very strongly disincentivizes somebody from behaving badly and from engaging in malicious behavior. And then the size of the penalty, therefore, only has to be proportionate to what can be lost from that penalty, or what can be lost from, from an adversarial actor. Um, and with ZK systems, to your point, it's not you know, incredibly high. So this is why I actually don't think that a lot of proving systems or proving networks or any type of architecture that delivers proof, proof markets, whatever, require, require slashing. So if you have $2 billion at stake in your, in your operator and I assign you a proof and the penalty for you not computing a proof is me not paying you for the next two weeks, well then what you've lost is proportionate to the risk-free rate of that capital over two weeks. And so let's say risk-free rates 2%. So you would expect um, 40 million per year in rewards and I compromise that over, over two weeks. So I effectively cost you 1.6 million. 30 second delay of liveness, 1.6 million in slashing, it's, it's rather high. And I can never, and I, in this case, I don't actually even go after the principal. I just go after the stake, or sorry, I just go after the, the ability for you to generate returns on that stake over a future interval, uh, jailing in essence. And that's what a lot of uh, prover networks and prover markets will likely move towards because it's much more capital efficient. And then the risk to the capital is much lower because you don't lose principal. And so the rate you have to pay is once again, proportionate to risk. And so you have to pay less and so the overall network's more capital efficient. Okay. And so would you, would you expect, or would, the, would anyone expect that the, the, because there's no risk of print slashing principle here, yeah. the, and Tarun used like credit rating, the credit rating of Lagrange's AVS would be relatively high. Like the, the yeah. risk of getting slashed or at least your principal getting slashed would be relatively the, that risk is relatively low, leading to a higher credit rating. Now, yeah. it, does that does that lower risk translate to potentially a lower reward, lower APY versus like some credit rate? I don't want to pigeonhole you here, but like, yeah, you know, is, is that is that sort of the the thought process? Yeah, like we're not we're not issuing short positions on top of eigenlayer, right? Like we're not. It's this is not like you get slashed if ETH price drops below a certain amount, where it's it's a, and you're getting yield based on someone else taking us out of the position. Like, um, you know, I, I I think what's what's interesting with with our design is that it is able to effectively create a um, environment where you can stake with a near zero risk of loss of principal, which means that insofar as you have ETH that you're staking, it is advantageous to restake it into Lagrange because you will not, unless there's a contract failure on, on, on one of our counterparties, you will not lose your ETH. Um, and that's a very powerful position to be in, we think, because it means that people who want to restake without wanting to risk their capital are able to do so in something that generates a nominal yield on it. And it might not be as large as if we're issuing options on top of of uh, restaked ETH, but it's 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 much less risky, and it's something that can scale to you know, right now we're at about seven eight billion restaked into Lagrange, but it could scale up to ten billion, twenty billion. Yeah, and it wouldn't be a systemic risk to the base layer. Anyways. Right, and and so I again like I don't want to use too many analogies from that previous podcast, yeah. but like it, it really does help put things in perspective. Like yeah, Tar Tarun helps uh, or he kind of illustrates this as like a bond market. And, yeah. and, you know, this, this, uh, there's essentially bonds for economic security. Yeah. And so for this case, like, yeah, you guys aren't, you know, slashing validators based on some, some ETH price up and down. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's like very predictable, um, and, and very low risk of getting your principal slashed. 
And so we would, we would, you could call this like a, like a triple A rated, um, AVS bond essentially, or, you know, uh, in, in the grand scheme of things mm -hmm. that that's one, one way to think about it. Yeah. We, it's one of the things we pride ourselves on. We, we want to be the, the safest, the safest AVS or one of the safest nice. AVSs. Uh, we want there to be a situation where people can stake into the network. They can work with the proofs generated by the network as DeFi protocols, as NFT projects, as um, uh, as roll-up teams, as um, interop protocols, and benefit from the proofs being delivered from them, and trust that the proofs will be delivered properly, such that everyone in the protocol is in a position where they feel good. Yep. And I think there is a large subset of ETH validators mm -hmm. that are not too inclined on taking some exorbitant risk. The, you know, yeah. they've already deposited into Eigenlayer. They, they're comfortable with that. And then I think, you know, we, we will end up seeing some sort of slippery slope down the risk curve. But ultimately, mm -hmm. those, those, those validators that go further down the risk curve are, you know, they, they've got to kind of watch out because that's what happens when you go further down the risk curve. Um, and there's probably going to be some of that. But, um, but for the most part, for any institutional mm -hmm. size capital or, you know, large validators, I, you know, I think it's reasonable to expect that they would, they would stick to lower on the risk curve, collect their APY that they could get from AAA rated AVSs and, mm -hmm. and be quite happy. Um, exactly. Awesome. So, so I, I do think that a large subset of uh, of ETH, ETH validators are going to uh, are going to absorb and and find this AAA rated AVS uh, quite quite nice. Mm -hmm. In addition to their ETH validator rewards. Totally agree. Um, and I, I would I would even add that when you have ten AVSs you can stake into without risking principal. If those AVSs in aggregate pay you 50 bips total, 25 bips total, it's advantageous to do so, especially if, if the you get a receipt token on that that you can further compose into DeFi with the same adoption. There, there really isn't a, a reason as a staker that if you are comfortable with the smart contract risk of using any of these services that you wouldn't stake into things that don't have slashing. Um, this is why if we look at LRTs right now, they've delegated them to almost every Hey, I lost you there for a second. Hold on. I still don't have you totally back. Cool. Yeah. So I think it makes a ton of sense um, that a, a significant subset of the Ethereum validators are going to go into these triple rated AVSs um, and, and collect yield without taking uh, risk to their principal. Yeah, that is how we envision the future as well. When the risk of slashing from an AVS is, is zero because the AVS has not implemented slashing, there isn't really a material concern about opting into many of these, which means that if you receive yield without any risk to the principal, you have to simply offset whatever the opportunity cost is. And given the, the fact that you can use these receipt tokens in ways that can pose within DeFi in very interesting structures, like you can, you can take a receipt token on LRT and you can use that within DeFi the same way you did using LST, it means that opting into 10, 15 AVSs that don't slash you for you know, a nominal yield of 25 bips, 50 bips is, is very compelling, especially for institutions that are trying to maximize returns on capital. Maybe, you know, a DGEN wouldn't buy ETH and then stake it into Eigenlayer if they're getting 25 bips, 
But if you're long, you know, $2 billion of ETH because you're a major institution, then it makes sense that you would stake that for your, your, your three and a quarter percent, and then you would restake it for your an extra 25, 50 bips. And so I think that we'll see capital continue to accrue to the AAA ABSs, the ones who, to Tarun's point, have you know, the, the, the best risk-adjusted return because they have the lowest risk. Absolutely. I mean, just taking like a very non-crypto native angle here is that, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're still only, what, four, maybe six months from, uh, no, probably less. The Ethereum ETF only launched, you know, a few months ago, you know, oh, yeah. very much just, just spot ETF for mm -hmm. ETH. I imagine, and, you know, a traditional financial person would know better than I would, but, you know, we're going to end up getting staking uh in those etfs we're going to see some some larger institutions allocate capital and then we're going to see incremental uh, adaptations to some of those uh staking uh configurations that are placed into those ED etfs and yeah maybe there's a basket of of triple a rated abs's um and we can incrementally accrue more risk adjusted return to these larger institutions that aren't trying to take any risk on their capital and they're comfortable you know with with the amount of return uh, that comes from this, and they can just continuously stack these these returns without adding any any risk to the underlying capital. Exactly, and especially once you've underwritten a smart contract risk that's inherent to every ecosystem. Um, for the first AVS you support, it becomes very easy to support the marginal AVS that is based on the same smart contracts. It doesn't, in fact, add any exogenous conditions or exogenous contract for slashing, um, and you get very strong properties like civil resistance. Um, from having you know stake-based uh, weighting of, of, of how actors are allowed to join the network, right? Where if you're if you're only allowed to compute proofs up to a certain amount, given the amount of stake you have, if you're only allowed to participate if you meet a certain threshold, irrespective of if you have slash and you have very strong properties of, of that guarantee liveness and guarantee in essence some aspects of safety by using uh, economic security that isn't slashable. Yeah, and and. What you're alluding to is I think that unlocks potentially new use cases that haven't even been thought about yet. Oh, and, it does. It does. Yeah. Awesome. Very exciting times. Um, imagination always goes wild during these conversations with you, Ishmael. Um, I uh, always appreciate you coming on the show. Love, love being on it. I appreciate you guys having me, and I'm, I'm glad you're not tired of me already. <laughs> We're just getting started. ZK is still <laughs> so so early, and uh, yeah, you always bring a you know a very interesting and, and informative perspective. So thank you as always. Thanks. Thank you. I really appreciate that.